Now this is tape 37 of the soon to be immortal sea fire series. We're really moving along, closing in on having this guy finish. And we have this really neat Battle of Britain tape we've been watching over and over again, trying to get these copies out to people, loaners, buyers, stealers. Rent them, steal them, make your own kind. This is a great tape. Really some good footage. And by the way, this, this footage right here with the Lancaster, this is for Bob Arenstein. Uh, anybody that's got any love of British airplanes, hey, we'll get you a copy of this, no problem. Lancaster, cool plane. Arenstein, and I bet you these, these retracts work perfectly. Hey, we're, we're having a lot of fun looking forward to seeing Bob Arenstein's awesome, awesome mosquito. But Bob, you're going to have to have projects that outdo that because eventually even that's going to be mundane. How about a Lancaster? I know Drindac could jump right on the opportunity to have one of these with four tune pipes or something. Anyway, cool plane, really cool plane. Get Mitchell to mold up one of those cannons. There's more gun blisters on this thing, too. Should give you something to work on, Steam. Get all four of these engines running. This morning, I want to get this in position. What I did last night, <coughs> I got all the hinges put in. But this morning, what I want to do is, yeah, they all seem pretty free. These are a little sticky, but I expect that would be the case. 
first thing I want to do, get the old chain lube out, and let each one soak. Even though this is kind of sloppy, this soaks in. I want to get these freed up before this epoxy gets to be a year old. And it may seem like this is a little bit of an overkill step. I also like to hit it where the, where the horn goes into the fuselage. Now one thing that's really neat that's happening here is we've had three or four nice days in the last week. And it looks like Joe may be able to get, Joe and Pete Whiting may be able to get down to Middlesex this Saturday for a flying session and we can get some time maybe on a double star, maybe get it broken in. I'm kind of really looking forward to it too, and tell you, to tell you the truth. Now the idea of doing all this is, I want to let this soak while I'm cleaning up. Every time that... <clears throat> Boy, I'm still sick. Every every time this year, spring comes, and I get the spring bug, I guess, as everybody does that lives in a winter climate. And one of the things we're going to try to do is get all the tools organized, get the batteries charged, get some new lines cut, get some new grip tape, get organized so we have all nice, fresh, new stuff we get out there. If we do get out Saturday, and even if we don't, at least we'll be that much ahead. In the meantime, while... Well, <clears throat> While I'm doing all those things, this chain loop can be soaking in, and of course I'll flip it over and do the other side too. Got all this stuff soak in, and by this afternoon, this should all be nice and free. Now we're obviously not going to be flying this for another couple of weeks, maybe even two or three weeks, but... Let me just let this see. The idea is to let it sit in this in this plane, let all the stuff sink in, give it a half an hour or so, we'll flip it over and do the bottom, and then maybe an hour or so later, I'll clean off all of the, the residue off of this, off of the hinges. So in the meantime, while this is sitting, that can just sit for half an hour now. <coughs> well, I don't know why I'm getting sick here. Anyway, every spring, and this seems like it's it's almost overkill. The grip tape from the year before can use that up. I get fresh grip tape, otherwise it doesn't stick the way it should. Make sure I have some lighter fluid. This is usually pretty well used up by the end of the year. Make sure I have oil for the wheels and controls. Some defogging agent for the sunglasses. A nice selection of all different heads for the engine for tuning. A couple extra needle valves. Selection of mufflers, and what I'll do is I'm going to take that Randy Hallcroft muffler and polish it up when I do. This is what usually happens at the end of a season of flying. They're all gringy and greasy and well, we'll clean these all up. We even got a couple that, are, that have already been iridited. But I can get this all organized, make sure, for instance, I have plenty of grip for the, for the, uh, the little pinches for the cable, make sure I have plenty of 91% alcohol. I'll get this organized today, and the reason is, one of the things, I've gone to the field many times on the first day of the year and forgotten one thing. One thing that makes me crazy. Why don't I have this or that or this screw or wrench or nose weight or something? And I try to avoid that, at least first flying day of the year. Pull the whole thing apart and figure out, yeah, we need this, we need that. Sharpen up the screwdrivers. I'm just looking around here. What else could be missing? Make sure I got plenty of head gaskets. Forget one thing and your day is ruined. I've gone there already. Started the engine once with the battery, and the second time I went to start it, the battery was dead, and I didn't have a spare battery. In fact, what I'm going to do, maybe overkill, I'm going to call up SIG, get two more of these brand new ones, because I don't, once I travel all the way up to the field, to not have a spare battery, or not have a spare set of lines, or a spare stooge line, or so, forget it, and I have to set up that new stooge that Mike brought, too. Other thing, we'll be setting up a new handle for the sea fire. And when this tape gets a year old, bink, just chuck it. In fact, I'll use some of this to, just to make my stooge line, all that stuff up. Extra handles, old handles, or just give it away, but fresh stuff. And it's always, it's always so important in the beginning of the year. Now, I haven't flown in yeah, six, seven months or whatever, and you forget, gee whiz, I need extra glow ply, I need this, I need that. This, this thing gets so dusty and dirty, 
you forget the basics of flying if you don't fly for a long time. Even a simple thing like just getting a toolbox cleaned up. Get organized, get cleaned up. I've said it so many times, it sounds like I'm overemphasizing it, but do it once. Opening day, get to the field, especially if you're flying with a stooge. Now another thing, you forget one thing and you may as well just not even go. Now another thing, I like to take all the planes that are in storage and we, we'll do one, one by one, I'll do them off camera. They all have fuel in the tank, I want to drain or run that fuel out, put fresh fuel in there. Or if you don't do that, the first run of the year, maybe what you want to do is just fly level just to get the fuel, the old fuel that's a year old out so you don't have a bad run or whatever. And it's not a bad idea to do that. And I also have after run oil. I use transmission fluid. That's just as good as after run oil and about a tenth the price. But I like, at least on the first day of the year, the choice is to, to go back and use a proven plane or an old plane and get a day of flying and have a day of fun. Never take the new plane out on the first day of the year and then pull a wing over pull out at one and a half feet. We have seen many people try and do that. It's not a great idea. One thing, I guess I'll put this on the video. This is a, you may think this is a bullshit idea, but this really is something worthwhile. As you probably know, Karen's been real sick over the winter, and we had, we determined that one of the things that she has is, a, is an allergy to dust mites. Well, we did a little research, and the doctor suggested we get this furnace filter that's made for asthmatics. And one of the side benefits of this, you can see what it does, it traps up to a millionth of an inch or something. But but also, he suggested, since Karen has a, uh, a little bit of an allergy to the chemical smells, to get one of these odor control pads to put in the filter. So I'm going to see how this works. This may be one of the things that will help her. And actually, anybody that has a wife that doesn't like the smell of dope, this is a $7 filter you can put in your furnace that's supposed to charcoal filter last three months. Again, we'll find out if this works. This is the kind of thing I'm a little skeptical about, but this was about 30 bucks. So for under 40 bucks, it may be that you can filter the air. Now the other thing, what I'm thinking this will do is keep a lot of the dust out of the house. And I do the dusting in the house, so I, mean, I don't look forward to every week running around the vacuum cleaner. This may be a really good investment. And it's a universal thing. You just set it up to fit the size that you need. It's got all these little frames and stuff. So, again, it may not be appropriate for your uh, environment, but I can guarantee you one thing. If you have a wife that doesn't like the smell of dope, Anything you can do to make life easier for her is well worth it. I've had several people, Alan Beers, I think, was the one that uh, that used to write me letters. He was almost in tears that uh, his wife couldn't stand the smell of the paint and everything. Hey, maybe this is something we could pass this tape on to him and give him a clue. If it works, let's see if it works first. I know a little bit about this kind of stuff. This is, this is carbon, and the carbon actually absorbs the odors, <clears throat> what it does. So I'm kind of looking forward to seeing if this is going to work. And obviously if it doesn't, the next time I put this on tape, I'll say, ah, ah, don't buy that product. But anyway, we're hoping it's going to work. Very easy to do. Frame goes right together. The thing what they did is they made these fit that one size fits all by just moving the corners in and out. Pretty creative way of doing this. I have to, uh, have to give them credit for that. That's pretty cool. That's all it takes. That may seem like, oh, what the hell's that got to do with modeling and spitfires and stuff, but believe me, if you can make your wife happy, if you can keep the smell in the house down, and this, I hope, is going to keep, as a side benefit, it's going to keep a tremendous amount of dust, and it's reusable. We just wash it and put it right back in a filter, so I think it's going to be a good investment, and I hope it's really going to work. I remember when I did the original vacuum bench, I didn't know if it was going to take, you know, be a profitable thing, spending all that time and energy. You know what? This is one of the most valuable tools in the whole shop. And I think that furnace filter is going to fit right in with the scheme of things. And even if you do want to, if they don't have these, I got this in a Home Depot, but if you're interested, you can call these people up. 913-384-3221.
might be something you want to check out, especially like Scott Smith if you work in a cellar or a house. Now, I've shown this on a video before. This is the stooge I got from Mike Kajeski. I put that little marine finish on it, that uh, polyurethane finish. I want to get a brand new stooge line made up. And I think the only thing I'm going to change on this is I want to make this wire just a little bit longer. I like the way this snaps in, by the way. You can you get a good grip on there. Yeah, that looks fine. What I'm to do is, is trim the back of this off since I don't need this length. And it'll what I want to do is try to make a little, uh, a little piece here that I can hook the stooge right into the side of the toolbox just to make it more convenient to use. I'm just going to try to trim this off. Now with that cut I could seal this with thin CA and I'll put a couple of coats of polyurethane on it as soon as the weather gets a little bit warmer. It's supposed to be a nice day today and if I do get a chance today I want to get that double start going. I want to get a little indication as to whether that's going to be uh, part of our arsenal or not part of our arsenal. And obviously we're going to find out first time we go flying. To make inch wire, these are stakes. Let me just show this. When you're going to use this on grass, because this is how Jimmy Casal hurt himself trying to use nails. Two things are two things are good. If you get big long roofing nails. The gutter nails, but but then the pain in the neck with gutter nails is you need pliers to get them out. These have little handles. I leave them at least a foot long. Two of these spike it down into the grass. Pretty much that's not going anywhere. I also made this. I changed this a little bit. I used a heavier wire. I guess I'm just uh, fanatic about this. I did have one stooge accident in my whole life with a little tailwheel stooge, and I'll never have another one. Once you see a tailwheel stooge release, and you're, and you're not out at the handle, you only have to see that once. Anyway, Mike Kajeski makes these. They're really a good, uh, as far as I can tell, this is the best made thing on the market. There are other ones, but this is a good one. Mike's a member of Pampa. Look him up in Pampa, and he's here all the time anyway. Nice. I think this is, this is overkill having it so long, but again, we'll find out. We're going to test it. Not a test of looking at pictures and video. Go to the field and test it. So I'm just kind of hooking this to the side of the toolbox. Only so when I'm carrying it down to the field, it would be a little more convenient than having to carry everything separate. Make some kind of a clip or bolts or something. I have to figure this out, what I want to do. So or not. I don't know Mike did this on purpose. It fits right in. By the way, these are the circle burner toolboxes. You can call Rich Peabody if you want to get one at 25 bucks, and they finish up real nice. And Mike's stooge fits right in the end with the stooge line. So the only thing I have to do is find a little bit different jar. See, my alcohol used to go on the side. I'll, I'll come up with some little a thinner jar for the alcohol, and I'm home for you all. And that'll take care of one other thing that I'm getting ready for uh, flying time here. great. I just found this. It's such a nice tight fit. It's unbelievable. And there's like a Windex-like material in here. I'm going to dump this out, put it in a Windex jar, dump the alcohol in there, 91%. That can be my line cleaning alcohol. And I would call this just a major, major little improvement. It's these little things like this that, uh, you know, you get a little bit of I did to do because it's such a... Uh I got so much of this stuff ripped apart. I always wanted to make, and this is one of the things I guess I uh, missed the boat on years ago. I always wanted to make my, the, well, let's, let's just call it my toolbox, that when I go to the field, I have everything and I can grab it with one hand. So I, in the past, what I've always had is the plane in one hand and then paper towels under your arm and fuel cans under your arm and something else here and something else there, here a pig, there a pig. So as long as I'm ripping this apart, this is really an appropriate time to do this. And I had this neat little piece of, see this is what happens when you start trying to invent things. I had this little piece of wood which I'm gonna glue up and put some sheetrock screws here so that I can have the paper towels bolted to one side of the toolbox, the fuel can, and the stooge. So when I go to fly, everything gets held in one hand. That's the whole idea. Oh, well, I did, I had a piece of aluminum and I thought, Oh, I got to get some way. See what I want to be able to do is when I go to the field, have everything 
in one self-contained unit. And that's the object of all of this. Whether it's going to work or not is beside the point. But well, that about finishes up what we're going to get done here. And it's time to go to work. Well, it was a little productive session this morning. And I'm really glad I got to get this organized. Next time we get to work, we have... Uh, we want to get that double star going. That's one of the next projects to uh, on our little itinerary here. Now tonight I have a little bit of time here, just a little. What I like to do before I even test run an engine or work on a plane, this thing hasn't been wiped off really in about six, eight months, so give it a decent coat of wax. And that's one of the steps I guarantee you people have gone out because they get all excited and they go flying and what happens is they forget to wax the plane or put some cleaner on it. What happens as soon as that raw fuel hits it when you're fueling the plane or whatever, boom, you got a problem. Now what I want to do, I want to try to retrofit that double star in here and if I can before it gets dark get out there and get a couple of runs on it and see what it sounds like. How this plane has had to at least two major repairs. It's still not in bad shape. Still from 10 feet away, it still looks pretty decent. So this will be a good test bed. And I want to take out all the Tiger stuff, put that all in a plastic bag, and see if it's going to drop right in. They say this motor drops right in. Just a little tip to you, too. Something that's important, at least important to me. These spinners we used were the lightest ones of the plastic available spinners. And guess what? Joe found out they don't make them anymore. So if you see any in hobby shops, scam them up. Even though they're kind of a nuisance to get on and off, they really do work well. Especially if you need a plane. If you have a plane that needs all the nose weight out, this is your candidate. Again, we have put the other double star in planes that had Tigers, and it was kind of an easy swap, but, you know, I still like to see it. You always seem to have to make some kind of a shim or some kind of a little adjustment. Be careful, because there's still fuel in this tank. I see it's not siphoning out yet. Anyway, I want to make sure everything is clean as a whistle in there, and boy, that's what I like about using aluminum pads and everything. Everything in there is just rock solid, ready to go. Well, it doesn't get any more drop in than this. Everything lines right up. And that really is a nice advantage if you have a Tiger 60 plane. Now, assuming we're going to like the motor. Now I gotta see if the needle valve is a good line up here. The needle valve hole is just a little bit different, but probably, assuming you were using a Tiger needle, you might have to move the hole because I have mine cut out for a max. This needle fits right in, and we'll see how that needle works. Kind of like a Super Tiger needle, even though my first preference is to have an OS Max needle with a spring. Now it looks like the crank, the shaft is maybe an eighth of an inch longer. A lot of ways you could get around that if you wanted to make a different back plate, that would be one way. We'll put a spacer of balsa wood on the back of the back plate and finish it to match the plane. But that looks like the only thing. I think it feels good to have motor grease on your hands and oil and all this stuff. I'm just, it's been a long winter and I'm itching to get oily. Like a duck itching to get oily. I want to test it with the muffler that comes with the engine for the first day to start with. There's only one problem, and it's probably unique to this plane, is the first fin on this is hitting. So what I'm going to do is just real carefully dremel away that first fin. And this way I'll be able to use the stock muffler. I want to have all the choices here. So I think the only way to give this a fair test, and I want to be really fair about it, is with the muffler that comes with the engine. Although we do have a tongue muffler made up for this already, but... How do I put this screw? 
By the way, one of the things that's really nice about the engine is there's really a unique tight fit from where the muffler hooks on. You almost don't need the screws. Now another thing too is this, mo this motor is, uh, well not with this muffler, but this motor is a little bit lighter than a Tiger, an ounce or two. And so with the lightest of the tongue mufflers, there might be a considerable saving in weight. Well, it really doesn't get a whole lot easier than that, that's for sure now. I talked to Joe and talked to Pete. We're going to shoot for Saturday if we can. No guarantee that either one of them can get the day off, but away from the family and really Pete has three daughters, so, but we're going to try like hell to get some flying in on this and give it a little evaluation. Now it's kind of breezy out here, but I got one run on it. I just want you to uh, share the experience here. That feels pretty much like a Tiger, as far as I can tell. It's got that characteristic bump. It's a little tight. I think I gotta get it two or three more runs. Still trying to determine if it needs two chokes or three. It's not a ring motor, so the characteristics are just a little different. And believe me, it seems like, at least from the flipping, it seems like it has an incredible amount of compression relative to the Tigers that I use. But we did get him, we did get some head shims with it. Now, the reason it's probably not sucking fuel is I probably have a dirty filter here because the first time it started, I had to keep opening up the needle on every every couple minutes. Now, if I have to, I'll take it apart and clean it. Now, let me take it apart and clean it. But anyway, at least you get a feel for exactly, it really does have a nice sound, too.
Now the only part of the engine I'm not really happy about is the needle valve. And again, I, I much prefer the, uh, the Max type. And this one, it seemed to loosen up. It got real loose toward the end of about the third run, so I don't know if we'll just keep tightening it. Maybe it'll seed in, but that's a minor problem. And obviously you could replace it with a Max needle too. But uh, yeah, once you get used to it, it's got a funny kind of a bump at top dead center because it's, it's not a ring motor. Ring motors don't have that characteristic, but other than that, it seems to have plenty of power and it's, it's pulling a 13.6, which is a real, a real 60 prop. So we look forward to getting flying. Now it's just a question of waiting for some weather. Okay, this morning, we only have a few minutes here. In fact, I don't have a, enough time really to do much else, but what I do want to do is, these have three coats of acrylic clear on them. I want to get these epoxied into position, get some, yeah, probably some 45 minute dry epoxy, and I'll babysit each one. I don't want to have any leaks or drips or drools while I'm putting these on. The acrylic dried up nice. I want to clean this up before I do the uh, the epoxy. Clean it up with M600 real good, just in case we have any of the gorms still in there. Now these only fit one on each side. This is the other side. Again, it's a lot of work making all these little detail things up, but boy, when they're right, they look nice. But at these, you know, on a real plane, the exhaust pipes would be hooked to the motor, not to the side of the plane. So to try to create that illusion, what I'm going to try to do is blacken in the area with a little bit of SIG dope, so it creates like a hollow effect and the pipes look like they're coming out of a, an empty shell rather than being glued to the side. Now this is a trick that uh, Ski Dombrowski told me about years ago. Mix a little black dye in with the epoxy so if any oozes out or even where the seam is, if it's not perfectly even, it becomes black instead of looking like chewing gum sticking out. Now this is also real good if you're going to put a canopy on. Put a little bit of black dye in. The dye is really inexpensive and then you can make epoxy any color you want for the rest of your life. But black is the one color you should have in inventory. I always try to figure out if I've got the right look on those exhausts. I'm just going to let this side dry, of course, and then flip it over and do the other side. Actually, this is a significant part of what makes this plane special. That paint is really, really too soft to buff out. I'll wait a couple of days and I'll get in there with some Q-tips and buff that all out. I figure I just screw the cannons in just to get some idea of how this is going to look. That always helps if you uh, get the paint off the screw before you try to thread these in. Well, we'll get them in anyway. Anyway, I'm real happy with the way the color looks relative to the black. It has a metallic, I guess gunmetal color is the right word. The fit feels pretty good. Anyway, these are drying up. And that really does give it a, uh, I don't know, kind of a semi-scale look. But the cannons, oh, I wish I had the cannons on the other plane. little touches, the exhausts, the cannons, the canopy. Now one of the things I want to look at too, and see, the canopy, because it slides in this track, I want to look, see if I can get a little rubber grommet in here, 
just to maybe take some of the vibration out of that. It's kind of a loose fit. I don't want to make it a real hard fit where you got to force it back and forth, but I think a little like a rubber grommet in there. That's the next thing I want to look at doing here. Got a little bit of time, and then we got to head out to the old Workomatic. Looking all around for different compounds of rubber, what I want to do is make a little piece that goes along here, so this will kind of give it a little rubber like gasket, I guess is the right word. So this will tend not to vibrate when the motor is running. Again, a Dave looks like a great a great place to use up your old Dave Brown wheels. Anyway, one of the things I had not thought of until you assemble a plane. Anyway, I love the way the cannons look. Man, am I glad. Every time I look at the, the Spitfire, I think, oh, if I only had another month or so to fool around with that. So many details I could have added. And I don't know if this is going to work, but we'll certainly give it a try. we got plenty of old Dave Brown worn-out wheels, especially from last year's Nats. Another good use for some black epoxy. I'm sure you'll find other uses for it. There's always something. Anyway, I want to wait till this just goes into cheese and then glue those two little, what I hope will be a little vibration dampeners in there. Now once this kicks off, we'll see how this is going to work. And we can always make these even longer, or we can always shim it somehow up there also. Boy, that, that worked near perfect. That, that was one of the best little modifications I think I ever made. Anyway, that's all we're going to be able to get done today. And uh, <laughs> I keep thinking it's going to be a flying day. Every day I look out there and the wind is howling. It's getting warmer, but the wind is howling away. But I really am getting in a mood to fly. Every year it seems like, and I guess this is going back, oh, how many years? <laughs> many years, too many years. I guess let's trace this back a little bit here so this kind of makes sense to you. I just wrote something for Stunt News that's going to appear in the next Stunt News. Bob Martens did a real nice drawing. But starting with the, uh, really with the Red Baron, when I did the Red Baron, that was really the first ship that had a a real legitimate built-in Ray Brother, and I was really, really impressed with how well it worked. So what I did is I did a retro, and Joe, several other people have done this, my Cardinal, uh, I'm just trying to think right off the top of my head, Tradition, Relentless, and I was so impressed that from that point in time on, and that Really, I guess we're going back talking about 88. Every single plane from that point on had a Ray Brother. Every one. Now, several top flyers, make this perfectly clear, several top flyers, and one in particular, I will not mention his name, came over to me at the Nats, sort of read a rudder wiggling and said, Ah, oh, what are you using that for? Oh, whatever. Well, I think he finished about six places down from me, so it really doesn't matter. But anyway, there's a lesson here. The lesson that I've learned is that this is a significant part of the airplane. There's several things along the way that have become apparent. And the linkage, that is several different ways of setting up the linkage. Mike Rogers, and in each year we've changed this. If you, <clears throat> if you go back over the videos, you'll notice we've changed it from, from year to year to year to year. But the, the system that we use now, and I just want to put this right on the tape, because there's so many people ask about this, if this is your eighth inch horn, you want to have the linkage. At least my feeling is this this should be no more than three eighths back. No more. And as close to the eighth inch horn as you can as you can possibly get it. Of course we're talking about that being on the outside elevator, which would be right here if you were looking from the top. So having this <coughs> 
And again, boy, I'm choking to death. Again, I haven't found this to be an ultimate critical, you know, super critical thing, but getting it up tight is. If you were to, for instance, make this horn longer, which I've seen some people do, what happens is the horn on the rudder now needs to be 12 inches to decrease the throw. So the only significant thing here that I can tell is to get the, get the ball link or the pivot as close up to the horn as you can get it in all practicality and to try, if really possible, this dimension from the leading edge back no more. And I'll just put this no more than 3 8 back. Now we've already got that. That's already in. It's already on the plans. It's on the plans to most of the planes in fact. And that that is something I don't think <clears throat> anybody that's ever built a plane and has that adjustment available to them would not take advantage of it. Now how much movement? When we set up a plane to start with, let's assume this is the fin, this is the rudder. So we'll try to just give a rough, and this is exaggerated, of course, for the purposes of making a, uh, a demonstration. Small prop. Let's pretend this, this, this would be a typical 12-inch prop movement, big prop, and of course, everything else in between. Roughly, what's going to determine these two things, the amount of movement is going to be relative to the size and diameter of the prop or the amount of blades. Now I found this to be perfectly true when I did the five bladed prop and this added to my knowledge in a way that <coughs> it's, it's really significant. And now if I was to do this for let's say for three and four blades and again this is a tremendous exaggeration we're only talking about one or two clicks but we need a I'll just put multi-blade or carbon. Now the reason is the carbon is heavier. So you can see what the, and this is the information, th this is what separates the people that probably haven't had good luck with a ray rudder and probably people that would never build a plane without one, is figuring out exactly how to dial it in. If we had that little baby prop and we had a very little amount. And probably, I would say, under 12 inches, it wouldn't even be a significant thing to worry about. An 11 inch prop plane, not, not something I'm gonna even worry about. But when you get into 12 and a half, and, and let's just put, for the sake of argument, to the 13, well, and I don't suspect many of us have bigger than 13 inch props, we're gonna need more rudder. If we go in a carbon multi-blade, let's, let's pretend we're going to try one of those five blades, a four blade, or a three blade. For sure, what you want to have is probably, and this is exaggerated, remember, probably we would go from this setting, this would be out one click, one turn on the link, two turns, and maybe this would be two or three turns. So the thing is you would have more and more movement with the bigger diameter of the prop and the heavier the prop or more blades all at the same time and this is this is what allows you to fine tune it's like having an adjustable tip weight box adjustable lead outs uh, just to name of other things it's an adjustment now let's let's pretend something let's pretend oh boy you know we just have a Dynajet stunt ship and there's no prop at all well if there's no prop at all, you won't need a rudder. Or you can even go further back and do what they do on Noblers, is airfoil one side, have no adjustment, and then probably most people glued on a little trim tab or something on the end. But having this adjustment, this is such a step forward, at least in my estimation, and in the planes that I've built, especially, especially on planes that you want to have a scale look to, where you don't have you're restrained in some way by having to make the rudder look a scale, size, or shape, or whatever. This is a significant thing. Here's the other part of the equation. And of course, most of this is interpolation. If you have, let's just make a generic rudder. And if you were to put the hinge line down here, just to make an example up, and this was 10 inches high. So you had 10 square inches of rudder. 
ideally, ideally, I think in an ideal or perfect world, this would end somewhere maybe an inch behind the flap hinge line, maybe a little less, a little more. But it wouldn't end up here is what I'm, what I'm getting at. So if you knew this dimension, if you know this is 10 square inches, if you're doing your own little interpolation, this is what I've found anyway. And now you increase that area, and let's say you want to make this semi-scale Bearcat. Well, boy, this Bearcat has a much bigger rudder, and it has a counterbalance. Well, now what you need to do, at least this is the formula that I've used, is you take any amount of counterbalance and get rid of it, because it's not going to... It's not going to really come into it. it. Aerodynamically, it does, but I don't count this in my calculation. And then I try to divide this amount up. And if, let's say, this amount is 15 square inches, then I need to reduce the travel by 50%, or roughly. These are just rough numbers to start with. Now, I know a lot of people that I've talked about this with, and the people with a lot of knowledge, don't agree with my my theory that the counterbalance doesn't really matter in this. Well, I know in, in, uh, in an all-perfect world, yes, it does matter, and air is deflected, and it does create an outward motion, but it doesn't seem, what it doesn't seem to have is the, the same effect as a real rudder has, and it's a, this is only a seat-of-the-pants feeling that I have. I don't have any scientific proof, needless to say, but I still think that if you, if you work off the, and it's a nice easy number to work off, 10 square inches of movement, and you, and you up that amount by 50%, you should reduce the travel roughly by 50%. Now, whether you take this into account or not, several of the planes, Spitfire, for instance, I did use this calculation when I figured it out, and it did come out roughly where it should be, with, within one click. So I feel that's a valid way of looking at it. If you don't agree, hey, you know, this is seat of the pants stuff. We're not engineers. In fact, to tell you the truth, almost nobody is, <laughs> except maybe Frank Williams, maybe Bill Netspan, maybe Jim Greenaway, but most of us just do it by the seat of the pants. But this is, this is legitimate information. Again, we're looking at that rudder linkage. If this is the fin, and this is the rudder, and you have a horn. You can never make the horn too long. What you'd like to have is several adjustments. Now, by, re by moving this linkage out, whether you use a clevis or a ball link, when you move this linkage out, it reduces travel. When you move that, that pivot point in, it increases it. Now, but keep in mind what's really happening here. What really happens is you can also reduce or increase, you can adjust the amount of travel by shortening, and that's why you have an adjustment on here. The same thing would apply if you shorten this rod, it would give you more travel. And if you lengthen this rod, so see what's really happening? You have an almost infinite amount of adjustment. And the only way you can kind of shortchange yourself is if you make this horn where you only have maybe one or two clicks, one or two adjustments, or you make this that it's difficult or impossible to adjust. With all of these adjustments and a little bit of flying time, trim time, almost everybody should be able to get a really beneficial, uh, what would be the right word, something that you can really put in the bank, especially if you have a plane that has a, a set rudder, basically a scale plane, that you can't just go in and chop the rudder off or square it off or whatever. I really feel one of the most significant things I've learned from all of the building of these planes in the last 10 years is that this is something that has worked for me and worked well and I hope you can use it. It's in the next stunt news too, by the way. Now, just looking at Joe's setup here. Now, Joe was Joe, like myself, was using a four-bladed prop. So there's a significant amount of travel when you set this up the first time. Neutral, I always have just a little bit of offset, very little. You never really want it to come back. Red Baron has a much smaller rudder. Strega has a rudder that's 
one, I think, if I remember right, a little bit bigger. But anyway, we wound up with a lot more travel. And the reason we had a lot more travel, notice, let's see if you can see this. What prop is on the plane? The five-bladed prop. Well, the five-bladed prop needed to have all that extra travel. The spit, the four-bladed prop, again, having all the adjustments is the whole key to this whole thing. If you have enough adjustments, you can get it dialed in. On the seat far, you can see I even made just a little bit more of a, of a, a rudder horn. What's the reason? The reason is we increase the rudder area. This hinge line is big. The, first off, the whole rudder is bigger. The hinge line is in a different spot, and the counterbalance is much bigger, along with the counterbalances on the elevators. So, again, my pet little theory that this little part isn't doing a whole lot. Mm, I don't know. Probably I'm I'm just guessing at that. But what I did is I measured from here down to get my true area, or the area that that basically is going to put a load on the horn. I guess that's the way I'm looking at it. Anyway, I'll probably start somewhere around the middle here. I'm going to hook up this linkage right now and just get some feel for... I have a lot of choices. I can use a ball link on both ends, a clevis on one end. That end I have to use a ball link on, and I want to have a threaded rod in between. I have 12, 12 inch pieces of threaded rod. I can kind of invent this as I go along as long as I have enough, enough adjustment and travel it. When I'm all done, I have plenty of adjustment on this guy. This is, this is something right now that probably will eat up well, a couple hours or whatever, but I really want to get it right. I really want to have it, hopefully, that on the first flight even, that I have it real close, and I'll just need to go in a click, out a click, and I'll have it. But a lot of times if I don't, because it's a new design, I'm willing to spend, hey, maybe even a whole day clicking this in and out, in and out, moving the, the ratios back and forth. But once you have it, boy, you go up for that square eight and it just goes... Instead of a oh, free flight, free flight, free flight. Oh man, I hate that. Or the top of the hourglass, when you can get it to snap. Uh, jo and, and Joe really went crazy the first time we did this. Get that real snap at the top of the hourglass. Oh, that's what makes it all worthwhile. All that little gizmoing and figuring out when you can get that trim right. Now, the Dubro number is catalog 181, 256 threaded ball length. What you have in here, and I've already dyed the the nylon bowling. We have these little copper connectors and some little lock nuts and washers and stuff that make this really easy to set up, relatively idiot proof. That's why I uh, I always have trouble doing it. <laughs> anyway, you get that the little ball is already on the plane. Now you, we have a choice. We can see which way is going to be more convenient to have a ball link or a clevis. And again, it will depend on exactly when we put this together. What we want to do is solder two of these together with a little piece of rod. First we have to figure out roughly what the length is, solder up the linkage, and then get a ball link on one end and a clevis or something equivalent to a clevis on the other end. Now believe me, you, you think when you go to make this linkage up, you think, oh boy, no problem at all. But, but there is an easy way to do it that I've found. This is an old linkage that I have off, had off one of the other planes. So what I do is I try to measure it. And I always put the ball link on as far as it'll go. Otherwise, this rod is susceptible to rotation in time. So then what I did, I made up another one that I know just, this is a, this is a slip fit. And I get the rudder in the position I want it in, and I just get it, well, just about where it should be. Now, this gives me the length that I'm looking for, and I can interpolate now. And I have this 12-inch piece of rod, so in effect, I can eliminate some of the copper. And this, I can cut this, and I'll have it real close on the first shot this way. This gives me exactly. I know this one is too short, because I only was catching the the uh, clevis on one thread. So rather than take a chance, I made up a little bit longer rod so that I have about half of the threads caught. Now that's another thing, and I've tried this at one time. I didn't want to make up another rod, and I only had this on by one thread. So I get to the field, and the first thing is I need to take some adjustment. I take the one turn off, and the link falls out. <laughs> well, this is how you learn the hard way. This is called seat of the pants knowledge. Now we have to tinker around for a while. What I'm going to do for the first flight is just leave it a little more offset. I know this is going to, some of the adjustment is going to come out, but at least we have a little bit here. Just a little bit of, you can see how much that is, a little bit of positive travel. 
But again, I'm only one click away from at any point in time just changing it over. Okay, it looks like a nice day. I think I'm going to go up to the field here. Looks like it. Now, I guess as you can see from this footage, the circle burn the field is about one third on the water. There's our table. The wind is blowing like a hurricane, so obviously we won't get a whole lot of uh, meaningful flying in, but we really do want to hear this motor run. But Joe and I are out here, and he's making up a handle, a cable, as we always do. Replace the cable, get a new cable in the handle. Got our little reorganized toolbox going here. We're going to do a little road test on this guy, make sure we haven't forgotten anything. The only thing, I had to throw two of my three batteries away. They were stone dead and wouldn't take a charge. So we got an extra battery, and we got a test plane. The only problem is it is a crappy day, and you can see a good part of the field is still wet and mushy, so. But we really do want to hear this motor run, and that's the name of the tune. Tomorrow we'll be able to fly at Middlesex. Now the first thing I want to remind Joe of is never throw away your Sullivan line clips. Guess what? Sullivan came out with a new line clip. These are now obsolete like dinosaurs. And the new ones look like uh, paper clips or something. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm sure these are better. These are combat clips. But I could not get anything but the other kind from SIG. I'm going to see if I, anytime I see these in a hobby shop, buy them up. I think these are going to go the way of the Tigers. 46s and 60s. Got neutral? Here, you better come out here and set this so that your guy's gonna twist the handle. Well, set it for you and then I'll just verify it. Leave the wrench out there. I just want it set for tomorrow so if we get some decent air in the morning, we can actually do some maneuvers. You know, my handle setting is a lot different. Yeah. Another couple of runs on this. We probably got a little less than a half a gallon of fuel through it. The only quirky little thing here is we don't have a muffler pressure fitting, but it ran real good without the muffler pressure. And we don't have a tongue muffler with the right bolt spacing. This is a little bit different than the Tiger, so we're going to get one more run on it and then try to get one flight in in between the hurricane. Oh, the cool box just blew over. <laughs> Every time you put fuel in this thing, the wind starts blowing.
they on the last run. The oil came out perfectly clean. It's just like brand new castor oil. So I'm assuming most of or all of the parts are pretty well worn in. The oil is crystal clear right now. This is going to be the last ground run. We probably got a little, little more than half a gallon of fuel through it. It's been pretty easy to start now. As it's breaking in, it gets a little easier to start. And what Joe's going to do, Joe's been trying to practice his, uh, his technique for videotaping, so I'm going to let him try to shoot whatever we get. We're certainly not going to do a stunt pattern, considering how lumpy the air is here. But this is the best way I know of to get some final runs on a plane. Now, the idea of this is, the real reason for doing it is if we pick up some junk in a filter or if anything crazy happens. We're not inverted and we're not sitting looking at a 10 minute run of dead lean going around in a circle. Just wish we had a little bit nicer air. The air is really lumpy. Anyway, we should, we should be... Uh, I hope if nothing else prepared for Middlesex tomorrow and they're predicting a nice day in the 70s, so we will get some flying. It's out of fuel, don't worry about it. Yeah, it didn't seem like it was out of fuel.
air gun if it's not level. Yeah, it doesn't bother you. It's just that when you get used to flying off a nice, you know, flat thing, you, you know, and then you fly down there, you, you, you just feel like, oh, the pull out. about at the end of our fuel here. But we did get a lot of runs on the engine. It has, when it was running in its range, it had a real sweet 2-4 brake. Really. I guess he's doing whoops. He feels good. We've been picking junk up out of the tanks. Not a lot, but look like little silver chips. But remember, this plane has been crashed. So I really can't blame anything on the hardware. It's real easy to do this when it's my plane, I know. <laughs> anyway, it seems like it has a real nice 2-4 brake. Now we're going to head out to the house after this run. I don't know how much fuel we use today. Maybe the eh, three quarters of a gallon. We can evaluate this data, take a look at, listen to the motor, and whatever else we can do, I don't know. But keep in mind, this plane has been crashed, and so we don't really know if the tank has a, even a little pinhole in it or something. Too late now to worry about it. We just want to go fly tomorrow, and maybe Joe will bring Mr. Awesome. Anyway, looks pretty good. I'm sure Joe's happy with it. So far, so good. Now, just so we remember, this is with the stock muffler, 5% passenger fuel, SIG glow plug, stock venturi, stock needle valve, everything exactly the way it's supplied by Tom Dixon. And about maybe three quarters of a gallon of runtime on the motor in a plane that's 65 ounces and 780 square inches on an unflyable day. <laughs> anyway. Been good, and we hope to repeat this. Well, we're going to go down the house after this. And get together tomorrow in Middlesex and maybe get some stunt patterns in, but this was a good one. So far, anyway. Well, Joe, we've decided to give it one more shot. We did have some stuff in the filter a couple of times, so Joe's going to give it one more. One more shot, baby. That's what I like about having a professional test pilot. I get to sit in the chair and shoot video. He works his ass off. Not a bad combination. Anyway, then we'll clean out the filter again. Remember, this was crashed I mean, severely. And uh, it may be that we've loosened up some solder in the tank or who knows, pizza crusts are in there. Transmission fluid. And the vultures of spring are already out at the circle bonus field. All the vultures have come out to dominate dominate they know we're out here flying so they got to come out and play whatever why get these guys turn these guys into a human sump pump here look at we water on the field hey another couple of weeks leaves will be on the trees we'll be ready to go flying again as you probably know joe's been a hurting puppy all winter so it's good to get him out here get him sunburned get him flying Get them good and greasy too. Anyway, this is our first day of testing the old double star light. So far it looks very promising. Now one of the side benefits of this motor, not a, not a critical thing to me, but it is a benefit. This motor is lighter than the Tiger 60, so even with the heavy muffler, the plane seems to have uh, you know inherited some new corner. Because of course the CG is far back. Further back, but and it is a big airplane, so using a 13.6 rev up stock, nothing changed, nothing cute. 
And it's been a long day out here, but it's been a good day. So we're hoping we're going to get to Middle Tech tomorrow and get some real flying and good air. Great. We shall see. Yeah, I hope so. Anyway, a good well, first day. In the meantime, K and B came out with a stunt mode. Is this an FT, uh, Tom? No, Flip that over so I can see the inside. No, this is a. This I haven't seen this guy yet. This had an HP in it when it started. Okay. It, it needs, as well as its pilot, it needs to go on a diet. It's okay, 65 diet. ounces, which is too much. <laughs> it's heavier than that. Yeah. That junker. It's oh a monster. Yellow paint is to be avoided at all costs. So now it's got a. Uh, you didn't use the extra pigment by Windy, I see. <laughs> That's <laughs> that. <laughs> this unsolicited testimonial by this failure of a human being. I should have used the extra pigment by Windy. Oh, I should have used. I should have. <laughs> anyway, I like that little header. That's nice. Three things you never say in real oh, estate. Coulda, no, woulda, and shoulda. Yeah. <laughs> now, that is what? I don't know what that motor is. Uh, that's, that's a, a thunder, uh, Mac thunder? Thunder Tiger. Okay. 46. Uh, okay. This reworked one, or a stock one? No, or? this one is reworked. Okay. By me, basically to Randy's pipe specs. Okay, and it's got the uh, the side exhaust to yeah, a rear side, side to rear head, whatever you call it. Which that. is really a you know running a yeah. side exhaust motor on a pipe is really a second rate excuse for for a system. Never took it apart yeah, you should just pay the five hundred and be done with it. <laughs> Anyway, I know a guy that flew at the Nats and got second place with a side exhaust. With a side <laughs> exhaust? <laughs> Don't tell anybody, they'll be on my case. Tune the pipe. Tune the pipe. Tune I know. Why, you can't even be a bigot around here and have any fun. Why? All right, fly it. I, we had our fun. It's your turn. <laughs> You're up next. <laughs> Wait a minute. Bark and cheese. Solicited testimonial. <laughs> Bark if you like 60s, two barks if you like tune pipes. Look <laughs> <laughs> that's four barks. Oh, no. <laughs> you guys can't have any fun. <laughs> Sure, our newest expert entry in the. I think he became an expert last year. I'm not sure, but uh, does some really neat engine work. Replaces the bushings in Fox 35s and does some cool stuff. Looks like he's getting hit with the same air we've had. The air is so lumpy here. Anyway, good guy, good man. Oh, yeah. We're basically going to head back, finally head back to the shop after a beautiful day. This is what I love about living in Jersey, this time of year especially. You wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning, you hear birds chirping. It looks like the air is going to be good today, or at least flyable, not like yesterday. And we're on our way down to Middlesex. And when we get back, we'll be ready to set up for uh, Stacy's birthday party tomorrow. 25 years old, hard to believe. Hey, take me flying. I know how to fly. Man, I like a guy that gets out here and beats me out to the flying field. Yeah, I already had my broom on. I swept that circle, got all the rocks and shit out of there. Good man. Looks good. Never been flown, right? Never been flown. It hasn't even been waxed since three years. Glow plug's going to come out first time we start this motor or what? <laughs> Last time we ran a plane for the first time, the glow plug came out anyway. Looks good, Joe. Let me go get the other plane. 
I'm ready. That's a cardinal way? That, that is a cardinal. All right. You love the smell of napalm in the morning, huh? <laughs> oh, you ain't gonna break that. Yeah, let's we'll see what happens here. Motor's already broken in. That's the that's the motor I was using in the stunters. Okay. Yeah, it's got time on it. It's not new. Yeah. Let me get the other plane. Huh? I'll go over and get the other plane. Okay. It, but uh, you know, we'll see. But one of the things you do, if it is nose heavy, we can put the double star in it. No big deal. Uh, well, I, you know, it's two years of, uh, in March, whatever. Yeah, you had this at one of the stunt forums. This is when you're, this is as old as Strager. Okay. And you didn't have it quite finished, for Strager, for the stunt forum. Right, right. Oh, you got the handle all the way open to start with? Well, as much as I can. And okay. Just, you know, we'll I got an extra handle with me if we need to jury rig one around. Yeah. I'll see where it is. Just strictly a test, test deal here. Yeah, I've never seen this out in the sunlight. The only time I saw it was at the show, at that one uh, stunt forum. All right, this will be the first flight of the, uh, the impressive and awesome Mr. Awesome. Glow yeah. plug ready to come out, Joe? <laughs> So what we're going to try to do with this, we're going to try to do some preliminary trim on this today. The tank is three years old, and it's up. obviously we're going to be shaking out some of the crap out of the tank. But always good to get the first run nice and rich. We'll clean the filter up first. Check that everything's nice and tight. It's really cold this morning. <laughs> That's good. After yesterday, we got faked out. It was so nice and warm. Not now, though. I feel like we're in New Hampshire at Midway. Anyway, this is the first shakedown run, and we're going to get, try to get some trim on this. The wing looks pretty level. Big Jim Tiger 60. We got Tsunami over there. You know, looks like we might catch some there. Where the hell is Tsunami? Can we walk away with him? Try to get some more time on the double star today, get some more feedback. We got the head gaskets with us. Well, it looked like the wing was, you know, as level as you could see from outside the circle. The only way you're going to know is when you fly it inverted upright, do some square eights, whatever, but sneak up on it. It's colder out here than I thought it would be. It's probably about 52 degrees now. Yeah, well, yesterday was warmer, so whatever. Well, the sun was acting well. This motor hasn't run for, what, two years? Yeah. And, uh... Still running too rich. Now one of the handicaps we have here, and this is something I guess you can figure out, we, well we have it on the other plane too. We don't have a muffler pressure fitting. And on th in this case, this engine combination, whatever, as soon as it takes off it goes a little richer, so we're going to have to set it a little bit leaner on the ground, just a little. We'll sneak up on this a couple of clicks at a time, especially in this cold weather. I got plenty in the box there, right in the top of the box. First, the first thing we realized is, and this is the typical uh, scenario for trimming out a new plane, it's light on tip weight. Did I overkill it with tip weight? Nah, put, put too much in. Put, put more than it needs to get started on this, especially in this chunky air here. Get some, what do you got in? You got a piece of lead or clay? Okay. Put some clay on there, it won't hurt. I always like to put it on the leading edge so it's kind of forcing its way back. You don't have a box with a bolt in it? Yeah, I do, but... Oh, let's put the let's put the lead in it. The hell with it. I don't like that. That's horse shit. Yeah. At least for me, what typically happens, if you start out with not enough tip weight in a plane, 
you wind up trying to fly the plane way too fast or with the leadouts way too far back or you got a ray rudder on this Joe <clears throat> with some kind of adjustment to make up for the fact you don't have the right tip weight and for sure this was up a little bit both ways upright and I really didn't uh, I didn't know how much was in there but a little bit extra certainly isn't going to hurt so for step one we're going to get a half ounce of tip weight. You'll get a half ounce in there, no problem. Now with the extra tip weight in here, I guess it's reasonable now. We'll see if it's straight inverted, if it comes around. The motor is still on a rich side, could go in one or two clicks. Most of that is because it's such a cool day. If it warms up, that'll, that'll take care of that. It's relatively level. See how he likes the feel. Nice, Joe. Never deviate from the stunt pattern while a man is taking pictures. <laughs> okay, we're gonna go. Next flight, one or two clicks in. And we'll get back to this puppy before we lose the air here. And how did it feel? It turns equally? Yeah. Semi-equal, what's the deal? So far, I don't notice any big difference. But it looked like you were overturning it on every, but it might be the handle too big, too. Uh, too big, too small. All right, you want me to fly it now? Or? Yeah, yeah. Okay, set it up. I want to see how she looks. Set it up, baby. I know, the leadouts may have to go up, go back. The flight that I flew, these are the things that we uh, observed and we're going to try to take care of in a short amount of time. The leadouts are too far forward. What I was seeing was I was seeing this, this wheel behind that one in about one third of the flight and one third of the maneuvers. So to start with, before you do anything, put them back as far as they'll go. Because you got plenty of turn. The thing turns like a like a rocket ship. I mean you don't you certainly don't need more turn, you know? As far as they go, Wendy is all the way back here, man. Well I'll put them back a half an inch anyway. Put them back a significant amount so Without we can see the, the difference. The yeah, don't drop the bolt. Don't do a windy. Well, that'll be how Yeah, well, that was, that was the big, because what was happening, all like on the outside square, it would get soft. You know what I'm saying? It would get soft as you're going around, and also want to come in two clicks on the ray rudder, for sure. Oh, you got almost no rudder on it. I didn't see that. I thought you had more than that. Go in at least two full turns on that old rudder, and you got it as close as yeah, it's a small rudder. Ah, you need more than that. Okay. Shit. That was the one thing it was doing on a square eight. It was getting soft. Soft that too. And top, you noticed too when you were flying the top of the hourglass. When it gets soft at the top of the hourglass, just go in two clicks. That'll take care of that. And I want to get a little trim tab for the top of the outboard wing. I don't want to try tweaking. Now this is one of the nice things about having this adjustment. You can just go in. I like to go in or out two clicks. Then I know if I went too much, I can just go back one and that'll be the maximum I can go. But otherwise, it turns like a rocket ship. It comes out nice and flat. It's just like the red plane. You know, like tradition. It's like a, card. It's like a tradition that isn't 25 years old. <laughs> like grandma before she was 70 years old, you know. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be good for And I wish we had a tongue muffler with a pressure fitting. I got one. That muffler is not doing you any benefit at all. It, all right, it's Joe. choking the hell out of the engine. You want me to... So let's do it all. Let's all do right. it all. Because we're not, you know, quit fooling around. All right, I'm going to really put some crank in it. Just in case they decide to hold the Nats here tomorrow morning, we'll be ready to go. <laughs> put always two at a time. Even if it looks like too much, give it two. Okay, here's what we have now for this, the tongue muffler. Totally unrestricted, 2,000 holes. <laughs> if, if this doesn't make power, we'll change the prop. The uh, trim tab on the top of the outboard wing with about a 30 degree bend. Lead outs back, two clicks in on the ray rudder. The master test pilot skip home will take, take this thing up and see if we can do anything with it. 
yeah, just hook up the pressure fitting and we'll reset the engine. That'll take care. Halfway between where the leadouts were and where they are now, and put the other muffler. The uh, that tongue is really wide open. Put the restrictive tongue on. Let's let's fly See, this I guy. Do is I got to get in there and change the screws. Which, right. All right, so I'll fly this a couple times while you're changing the screws. No problem. Uh, 
You still have them two clips I gave you yesterday? I'm gonna get a couple more runs on this guy. He's he's really getting friendly. Real nice. I think the next thing. Joe, when you get another cut, you gotta change the spinner on there. When you get another couple of flights, we get one or two on this and I wanna put a head gasket in here. Soften it up. But it's really got a nice two four break so far. Which one are you talking about? This guy. Well, you got the muffle? Well, I wanna get one more flight. And then we'll put, we're gonna try a head gasket, it's getting warmer, should soften up the power. The last couple of flights with this have been real pleasant, real friendly, real mild, and we're ready. We got the equipment out here, we want to change a head gasket, put a head gasket in. If, if anything, with this plane too, it's just a little bit on the powerful side, and the choices obviously that we have is the muffler. We don't have one that's drilled and tapped the right uh, width, and it's not interchangeable with a Tiger exactly anyway. So rather than do that, we're just going to add one head gasket at a time, try to soften up the power. In the meantime, Joe's got the lead outs halfway back in position. More Ray brought her offset. And you lost the trim tab, huh? Yeah. Okay, well, and the other tongue muffler. Now, this is the tongue muffler that's kind of in the middle. Yeah, but i got a heavier spinner. So heavier I spinner. I want to see if that makes a difference. If it doesn't... Yeah, and that's... That... See, the weight of the spinner, you would think it's going to help bank the plane out, get the... But we don't know the vertical CG. We didn't do that before we came out here this morning. So we're just going to try the heavier spinner for now. And if we have to... You found the tab, though, right? Yeah. If we have to, we'll just get some extra tape and put two layers of tape on there. All right, I'm ready. Turned out to be a nice day. At this flight, we got the leadouts halfway back, halfway up forward. The idea at this point in time is just to get everything roughed in, to get, when you fly in a plane, that the two landing gears kind of line up, or that the one on the inside of the circle is a little bit ahead of the one on the outside of the circle, assuming that they're parallel. The thing that you have here is the, the trim tab came off the wing. We're going to have to put it back on. It's still down inverted. It's up upright and down inverted. It's going to need a little trim tab. Just trying to make some mental notes here. So we go back and look at the tape, we can evaluate this. It looks like he's got the rudder just right, but we'll be looking to see on the, the outside part of the square eight. And the reason we're speeding up the motor run here is it's really starting to get blustery. But we have gotten two really good hours so far in this, which is unusual. Plane has a real hard corner, turns a little bit tighter inside than outside. Now, when I was flying it, it was turning just a little tighter. I could have taken care of that by adjusting the handle, but Joe's going to do the rest of the test flying on this guy. But even the outsides are pretty sh plenty sharp. I think that's only going to be a handle adjustment. And what we're probably going to do is spend the rest of the day just trying to get some head gaskets in the double star. And by the way, the motor is working out real nice. It's real nice in a plane like Tsunami. Where the plane isn't overly heavy, it's a 65 ounce plane that just, just seems to have just the right amount of power. The idea of the head gasket, of course, would be just to soften up the two cycle power a little bit. It's doing pretty much what uh, the instructions that came from Tom Dixon say, using about four and a half ounces of fuel of flight. Likes to run on a 13.6 rev up so far, real happy with that prop. I was not crazy about the SIG glow plug, but I don't have a new Thunderbolt. I don't expect that would be a big deal to change that. This looks like it's... Just the only thing now we're going to try to work on with this guy is get the wing level with a trim tab. But again, sometimes if you just see what... This is a typical first day out, first day of spring. We haven't flown all winter except for yesterday. Get some time on the plane. Now, the reason for shooting video, you go home now. Put the tape in the machine. Turn up the sound really, really loud, and you can hear if your motor's running. Is it running the 2-4 the way you want? Is it running in a constant 2 or constant 4? Nice top on the hourglass. Nice hard corner. We can identify all the things that are good, all the things that are bad. But this plane for sure is going to need 
is to really set the vertical CG, hang it by the lead outs and plumb bob it. We've done that enough times on tape. Make the adjustment as much as we can, reasonably make it, and then the rest do it a trim tab. Or a flap tweak, although it isn't really... I don't like tweaking flaps. I would much rather have a trim tab if I, always, if I have a choice. Ray Bretta looked real close. It wasn't yawn on the top of the hourglass, and yet it looked like it had plenty of tension. I don't see a lot of hinging and yawn that we have to address here. All right, so we've got some good data now in the data bank. To the end of the day, or the next time Joe and I sit down with the tape, we can make some mental notes. And I want to go over and get a head gasket in the double star while he's finishing out this flight. This is one of the things Joe has, is a little, uh, like that foam thing that I use in the shop. He brings it to the field, and you, you store the plane in this when it's in the car, or? Well, that's all I carry in my hatchback. Oh, okay, but this is a little handy now on the field, because we're going to change a head gasket. And I think, how many came with the engine? There's a couple of them in that pack. Anyway, we'll put one in at a time. Just one, I think. Usually adding a head gasket will soften up the power, extend the mileage a little bit, and give you a little bit more of a uh, motor run, rather than holding it in one speed for the whole flight. Now, just for anybody who may never have seen us doing any of this kind of stuff, whenever you take a, and this is a metric, we want to use the metric wrench, and what I do with my metric wrenches, and this is a good tip, let me see if I can get this, is I put these scratches on them so I know instantly it's metric. The other 440 ones don't have the scratch, and if you use a 440 wrench and these screws, you'll booger them all up. It'll probably tighten once or twice, and then you'll booger the screw, so. Metric wrench, number one, and I want to loosen this in a star pattern, just like you would do in automotive, and if you've never done that. Loosen, loosen. Loosen, 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 loosen. And when you tight, a little bit, a little bit, back and forth, constantly making a star pattern. Same as, same as you would on a car. Now you can see, even though this motor has about a gallon of fuel, it's burning real clean, it's burning real even. Sometimes when you take a squish band motor apart, you notice it's all black on one side or not, not black on the other side. It isn't, it isn't burning clean. This is a full burn Hemi head. This particular motor came through with, with these gaskets, with three gaskets in there. The aluminum one up against the head and two copper. So the next, the next test that we're going to run is going to be the aluminum gasket, and I clean this off with a clean paper towel and three copper. And that should soften up the power quite a bit. And we still have one left. We can even go a little softer than that. When you get that power nice and soft, oh, gee, it, most people like it harsh, a hard break, but when it's soft, you really get nice, smooth, slow maneuvers. Turn in the order. To get this puppy back up. I had a situation after a day of flying here is that the plane definitely has more corner than you need, and we don't want to resort to nose weight or anything, so what we're going to do is move the handle in one notch at a time until we get a setting that's comfortable for Joe. And that's a custom thing. If two people, even two people of the same skill level, they'll wind up with totally different handle sets. So this is kind of like fitting a pair of shoes. Okay, you were in the fourth. So I'm going to the third. Okay, that's, that's reasonable enough. Spitfires. Okay. So I just got to fish this through. I'll be in high velour. Yeah, you're in high velour. This is turning out to be a decent day. Oh, I didn't expect it to be this good. No, this is I could go for a little more warmth, but uh, hey, who said it was going to be easy? It'll be, it'll be all them 90 degree days out here. Yeah, you'll be sorry that it's warm. You'll feel like you're living in uh, Florida or something. Somebody over there with a little scale plane. Looks like a Spirit of St. Louis. Yeah, it's the beginning of the season. Everybody's got the bug to get out to the field. This 36? Yeah, this is the Spirit of St. Louis from the Mechanics Illustrated. 
Remember they used to have plans? Yeah! Oh yeah! Show us Real old ones? Yeah, I never got to see this one. What is that, a Fox 15 or 19? Oh, it's a 35. Oh, 35, okay. Yeah. Cool. Here in St. Louis, it was, uh, showed a Bantam engine in it. Yeah, yeah. It flies great. Now, you know, John Pothia wants to build a, uh, you know, a Palmer High Boy with a little 25. I'll bet the damn thing is fly good. Pothier, if you're watching this, check this out. This thing is flying great. I can't believe it. It flies inverted and everything. Look at this. Unbelievable. Fox 35. A surprise an hour here on opening day.
more books are still funny. That's Saul Polis. That's the second one in there, Mike. Bill. A happy Mr. Ross and Pop. All right, that trimmed out well in one day. That's it there. Thank you. That's definitely going to uh, going to be a fun plane to have. Cardinal Air. Bill Zimmer sent these pictures in of his smoothie, Fox 35, Martine muffler, and of course the mandatory eighth inch control horns. And he said they were the only reason he got through the wind. Those beautiful golden eighth inch control horns. Unsolicited testimonial from Bill Zimmer. Anyway, it looks like Bill's been watching a lot of videos. And look at this nice finish he's got. Not bad, Bill, I'll give you credit. Anyway, Bill really did say uh, he had a real adventure of a wind flight. Everybody was impressed out at VSC. And he said those Ertnowski control horns came through in a wind. Bill, you're okay. I don't care what Doris says about you. Thanks for the photos. We'll pass them on to Stunt News. <laughs> Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's nice to have a sea fire. Believe me, it's nice to have buffed out planes. Let me show you what's even nicer. I gotta sneak up here, see I gotta do this like clandestine. And I know you don't mind sharing this stuff with me. Share it, hey, we're not getting rich anyway, so what's the difference? I mean, we ain't gonna win the Nats anyway, so. All right, girls. This is an interview. This is Stacy's 25th birthday party. She's gonna dance for us, lady. You got your tutu and uh, your nylons, fishnet nylons. You got the wife cooking away here. Oh boy, we're gonna have leftovers this week. Hard to believe. It's hard to believe. And that's why the sea fire is behind schedule. We gotta go bomb Berlin here. We're gonna go play birthday party today anyway. She's a great daughter and we love her a lot. <laughs> sorry, no. hey. Hey. Sorry. Yeah. You that was great. Great. How about a few bars of Wendy, you're the greatest. <laughs> Video man sees all, knows all. Party, I'll tell you, we have had a wonderful party. are not so shabby. Thank you. 
to end this tape with uh, a couple of comments. One of them was real happy the way this is coming out and I'm happy that I'm able to share uh, I don't know, I guess life's experience itself. All my friends all the people that uh, seem to wind up with these tapes, some of them who buy them some of them who don't, some of them who steal them and whatever. But anyway, it's just great being able to share it with you. If we had no video, I mean, you know, still photographs and letters wouldn't be the same thing. I don't think they would be the same anyway. And you'd never get to see Karen's daughter, and boy, are we proud of her. She's playing in New York City. She's played in nightclubs already. She's actually gotten paid to play. Something I wish, uh, <coughs> I wish I could say. <laughs> Somebody would pay me to do a thing. Anyway, we really do, really wish her the best. Anyway, we're going to be picking this up on the next tape. There's just so many things left to do. So little time. The flying season's already started. We have landing gear to make. Spinners. Custom mufflers. We're going to be spending some time down in the machine shop. We're going to be reworking some engines. We're going to probably be making a couple more five-bladed props. And we're going to be getting some more, I hope, some more motors, mufflers, things to test, things to enjoy, things to share. So... I'll close out the tape by saying I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope you will con continue the fine tradition that Harold Price set for me years ago of, I guess, just humiliating me into uh, to wanting to share this with other people. I'm really happy the way this plane has come out, and I'm really happy for all the people that have picked up good information from seeing it be built, seeing it be buffed and whatever. Please, as I always say at the end of every tape, please share the tapes. The knowledge that you have in this world, the information that you gather, really doesn't belong to anybody as such. We don't own things. We're only in temporary custody of them. And I certainly feel like uh, when Harold passed this information on to me, and that was many years ago, before he passed away, I felt a very strong obligation to pass it on. An obligation that video has let me do in my own special way. And I don't know that other people won't someday carry on this tradition long after I'm gone. I'm I'm getting Midgley to swear that he'll do that, but needless to say, he's got a family of his own. So we don't know if he's ever going to come through. Dave, you better, though. I'll come back from the grave to haunt you. 
Anyway, thanks for joining us.